Grateful Society. Uh, thank you for coming out on such a blustery, if not warm, evening. I guess so. It's not two and a half bad. But this is a this is around the time when weather always becomes an issue with our lecture series. So, uh, if in doubt, any any particular month during the winter, uh, we have to cancel. Uh, all you have to do is check the uh, storm center at CBC website. Uh, we normally list there, and if we get enough advance notice uh, from the weatherman, we'll even uh, put it on our website. And I, I think uh, Allison, our office manager, is in the habit of ch uh, having a phone message at our at our office uh, phone number as well. If you need a need to know quickly whether whether the lecture has been canceled or not. So uh, something else I'd like to mention: uh, January is our primary membership renewal period. Uh, that's an artifact, really, of the uh, the calendar year approach we took with memberships up until a few years ago. Um, it doesn't matter anymore when you join up. Uh, your membership is valid for 12 months from the from the, the time you you sign up. But most of our long-term members, uh, generally prompt with renewals, are still on the January to January cycle, uh, which makes this uh, a great uh, time of year to remind people of the, uh, uh, the importance of membership dues in terms of our society activities. Uh, as many of you know, our membership includes a subscription to the Newfoundland Quarterly, uh, with whom we have uh, a long-time uh, partnership. And you probably know the, uh, the Aspects article each month or each quarter in the quarterly is produced by the History Society. And these Aspects articles are edited internally. Uh, John Ritzy uh, with the Center for Newfoundland Studies and Linda White with uh, Modern Archives are serving as editors, co-editors at the moment. Uh, membership also entitles you to reduce costs on society publications, and that includes the, uh, the uh, very popular short history, which has already been through a, th a third printing, and uh, is uh, scheduled for a major upgrade sometime in the coming year. Uh, we also send out a society newsletter three times a year, and we try to keep members informed by email of, of uh, society activities and other historical activities uh, in the city that may interest you. And then uh, you do appreciate that monthly lectures and symposia are open to the public free of charge, but uh, we we're able to cover AV costs and uh, uh, speaker travel costs and refreshments and other incidental expenses uh, on the strength of our membership dues, so they're very important to us. Anyway, uh, it also enables us to hire a part-time uh, office manager, and that's Allison Mercer who's at the desk outside. So. She's the lady you have to see if you want to renew or take out a membership uh, tonight or any other time in the future. So, uh, A couple of other business items very quickly before I lecture. Uh, the Society has been invited uh, to organize symposia and other events over the uh, period uh, 2014 to 2018 as part of a, a fairly major provincial initiative commemorating uh, World War I, the 100th anniversary of World War I. And so we're presently working on a funding submission, and uh, we'll have more to report on that uh, very shortly, probably in, in an upcoming newsletter. Another quick point, uh, Lieutenant Governor John Crosby is stepping down in March, and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Crosby have served as patrons of this society uh, since they've been there at Government House, and they've been extremely supportive of this uh, society in many ways, uh, promoting publications. I think John Crosby has purchased more copies of the short history than anybody on the planet. It seems like every visiting dignitary gets a courtesy copy, so uh, we're always sending 10 copies here and 10 copies there, so it's wonderful. Uh, he's, he sponsored Heritage Awards presentations at Government House, and he's attended events, and uh, we will most certainly be sending them an offer appreciation uh, on the Society's behalf uh, before they uh, leave office. Uh, one final thing, if you're wondering about the Colonial Building and when we'll ever get back there, I checked this week. And uh, we've been told now that late 2014 at the earliest, and the spring of 2015 at the latest, so don't hold your breath, another two years. Uh, so that's it, uh, time for the lecture, and for that I'd like to call on Terry Bishop Sterling with uh, Mon History to introduce tonight's speaker. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I've been asked on behalf of the History Department to make a little community service announcement. Um, those of us in Newfoundland history have many opportunities to uh, share our work with you. Um, but uh, this semester, um, with an initiative from the Vice President's office, 
Um, our, our other colleagues who are in various fields, American history, ancient history, are also going to be um, um, participating in a series of public lectures. Um, ne the next one will be uh, uh, in conjunction with Family History Society here next month, the last week in February. Um, Mark is going to be here again to speak on a different topic along with our colleague Valerie Burton. Um, I have the opportunity to present some of my work um, at the rooms on their regular series at the end of February. And then we'll have, uh, I think, three more presentations through March and early April. Uh, I haven't got the exact dates and topics of those yet, but keep an eye on the History Department website and watch out for those. Uh, so we'd, uh, we'd love to see people come out and see some of the other interesting work that's being done in the History Department outside the area of Newfoundland history. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce my colleague, uh, my newest colleague in the History Department, uh, Mark Humphreys. Mark completed his PhD at the University of Western Ontario in 2009, where he studied under Dr. Jonathan Vance. He came to Memorial's History Department in 2011 via Calgary and has a wide range of interests in the social history of, war of warfare. He has published about a dozen essays in Canadian, British, and other international journals, as well as a few edited collections of books. One of his most recent articles won the Canadian Historical Review Prize. He is uh, the editor or co-editor of four books, including the multi-volume series Germany's Western Front, Translations from the German Official History of the First World War. Uh, his, uh, the second volume of this is, uh, is coming out this spring uh, from Wolfgang Loria University Press. Uh, his first monograph is The Last Plague, Spanish Influenza and the Politics of Public Health in Canada, which was published last week uh, by the University of Toronto Press. Uh, he has many grad students, a very popular teacher, uh, he's a great uh, colleague for committee work, and his classes at Mon are, uh, are uh, filled to the brim. He's scrambling to, between all this to finish a second book called War's Lingering Touch, Shell Shock in the Canadian Expeditionary Force 1914 to 1920, which is coming along. And will also be published uh, with the University of Toronto Press. Mark is living in CBS with his partner, another wonderful colleague, Leanne, and their two cats, Leon and Audrey. So please welcome to our conference. Thank you very much, uh, Terry, for that introduction. Terry and I spent all day today in uh, meetings together, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And thank you to everyone for coming out on what is a warm but, yes, blustery evening. Um, I should start by saying that uh, this talk is adapted from uh, a paper that's currently in peer review that, uh, at a Canadian journal um, that I wrote uh, back about a year ago or maybe eight months ago, and it's adapted for, uh, for tonight. I think it's only fair to say that I've benefited from uh, the advice and help from a number of colleagues in the department, uh, for better or for worse, uh, better I think if, if the paper goes well, uh, would be uh, Sean Cadigan, Olaf Jansen, uh, Jeff Webb all read drafts of the paper and their comments are reflected I think in here. Neil Kennedy gave me some advice on French Atlantic sources, Trevor Ford who's in the audience at the back, uh, was my research assistant in Ottawa. And Robert Sweeney and Leanne Liddy assisted with difficult 18th century French handwriting and translations, uh, which can be quite difficult at some times. So you might be wondering how a historian, mainly of the First World War, comes to be writing on uh, the occupation of Newfoundland in 1762. As many of you will know, last year did mark the 250th anniversary of the Battle of Signal Hill. Right here on our doorstep, of course, the last confrontation between France and England played out in that long, great struggle for empire in North America. Now, when I moved to St. John's in the summer of 2011, like many mainland Canadians, and if you can't tell from my accent, I'm originally from Ontario and came here by Alberta, and I knew relatively little about Newfoundland's place in the Seven Years' War. It's telling, I think, that if you go to any of the major mainstream works on that seminal and important conflict, the Battle of Signal Hill in Newfoundland is mentioned only in passing, if at all, and then often literally in a footnote. To give you but one example, and it's especially egregious, in Fred Anderson's recent masterful and much lauded history, The Crucible of War, The Seven Years' War, and The Fate of Empire in British North America, the Newfoundland campaign is discussed over four sentences in a 900-page book. Shameful, I would say. I knew little more than Anderson had written in his book, specifically that the French came, captured the town, and were expelled by the English, 
long after the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. It was a story that deepened my memory from reading books on this uh, several years ago, uh, that was also comical in nature, an ill-fated expedition, and exampled the hubris of the ancient regime in France. And indeed, that has been uh, often the track taken by the historians of the Seven Years' War, who have been more interested in events on the continent than on this island. Now, being curious in nature, and I think naturally skeptical when three-month occupations are tossed off in a sentence or two as simply being an afterthought or insignificant, Keep in mind, too, that Wolfe did spend about three months laying siege to Quebec. I turned to Newfoundland historians who, of course, had done anything but forget the campaign. That first summer and fall, I devoured David Weber's detailed military study of the recapture of St. John's, Olaf Jansen's excellent analysis of the campaign's place in naval history. Living here, I took advantage of uh, walking the battlefields at Torbay, up Kitty Vitty, and uh, up to Signal Hill. I read Gordon Hancock's thorough work on the occupation of Trinity and plowed through the diaries of merchant Benjamin Lester, which he had transcribed and generously donated to mine. I, of course, dug out old archaeological surveys, and as you do when you're a historian, I took my vacation up to Trinity and went uh, on the long road out to the, the point where the fort is. I should say that that is not a road that's all that friendly for your Volkswagen Jetta, but I managed to make it out there. I then made countless trips to the rooms to look at old court records, Spent long hours poring over grainy microfilms of French and British colonial records at CNS. Looked at old English newspapers from the QE2 library. I sent my research assistant to Ottawa to recover some particularly obscure documents. And made difficult negotiations for documents from the Archives Nationale de France. Many of these had, of course, been used by historians before. Some many times over. Others, remarkably, though, not at all. But all history, I think, is about reinterpretation. For me, I found the topic fascinating because I am a social historian of war, which means that I'm interested in studying how conflict affects the lives of ordinary people. Most of the histories that I had read, while excellent in their own right, focused mainly on the military campaign to retake St. John's or a naval strategy. But what I saw in the primary sources, what was new to me, was the unique opportunity that they presented, that this wide and varied collection of sources presented, to study how ordinary people responded to the pressures and terrors of invasion and occupation nearly a quarter of a millennium ago. Here I had letters, diaries, newspaper accounts, official records from both sides, archaeological evidence, and much more. There was a richness of the source material that I had never expected to find, illuminating the daily struggle for survival in a world turned upside down. For three months that summer of 1762, between the 28th of June and the beginning of September, the middle of September, the fishery stood still. As I began to read Keith Matthews, Grant Head, Gordon Hancock, John Mannion, Peter Pope, and Sean Cadigan, as well as many others, I began to realize just how dire the situation must have been for those who were living here. As a group of pool merchants wrote when they got wind of the attack in uh, early July of 1762, it was an occurrence sure to lead to, quote, a state inseparable from want and famine, an event much to be dreaded, an evil immediable upon the approach of winter, and a calamity from which no relief can be expected. Now, as a social historian of war in society, I see invasions and occupations primarily as socio-economic events, events that generate extreme pressures and fear, ripping open social fabrics, and laying bare underlying tensions and conflicts in society. There are moments pregnant with possibility and fraught with danger. As fear, the inhabitants of Poole the customary, or when the customary socio-economic relationships between English merchants, resident planters, and migrant servants broke down, normal patterns of exchange ceased to function. This, of course, was to be expected. Invasions and occupations are, after all, destructive events. But what was surprising, what came through clearly in the documents and gripped my attention, and I hope will grip yours, was that civilians were not just hapless victims, deprived of all agency and the power to control their own destinies. Certainly, as we'll see, some were. No question. But many were aware that this was, in fact, a calamity from which no relief could be expected, and therefore took matters into their own hands and made difficult choices that were intended to protect their own interests. And in fact, in many cases, they succeeded. As I'll argue here tonight, the 1762 campaign presented people living and working in Newfoundland with a series of difficult and unpalatable choices. To preserve their lives and livelihoods, some chose to resist, others to collaborate, still more to flee. While some were ruined, others maintained their position, some even managed to profit from new opportunities. Civilians, I contend, were not then without agency, and retained the capacity to act and to make decisions that had a real effect on their own destinies. 
These choices were made within the context of their lives as citizens of a larger North Atlantic world, and in this respect, the 1762 campaign was indeed a significant event, overlooked by many previous historians who concentrated mainly on uh, events on the continent. And this, to me, underscores the fluidity of the, this type of an environment, its contested nature, as well as the important place occupied by the island in a much larger Atlantic world. To set the stage, we must retrace now familiar ground. English fishery at Newfoundland began in the 16th century as, as a migratory enterprise in which merchants, mainly from West Country ports, hired servants to travel to the island where they would fish, dry their catch, and return at the end of the season. Although this is an oversimplification of a very complex and changeable economy, let us just agree that uh, the best grades of dried cod were sold in England and Catholic Europe, while the lowest quality fish was shipped to the Caribbean to free African slaves who worked the sugar plantations. As Peter Pope has so clearly shown, golden wine flowed back to England from Spain, Portugal, and Italy, while rum was brought to Newfoundland from Jamaica and Bermuda. This maritime trade and failed sediment schemes in the first decades of the 17th century established a small resident population on the island's rocky shores. Initially, these settlers posed little threat to the migratory fishery, and over time, though, some servants began to overwinter here to get a head start on the next fishing season, claiming the vast fishing rooms and drying beaches, of course, by right of first occupancy. From these rooms, they hired their own labor, which was supplied by merchants who did business on both sides of the ocean. These men, and some women, became resident fishermen known as planters. This is, of course, all of you more for me than I'm sure for you. As the resident population grew, so too did their share of the fishery. The enterprising traders began to supply residents not only with laborers, but also with the goods required to survive on the island and to fish. Because Newfoundland had limited agricultural potential, a critical point here, and one emphasized by Sean Cadigan, Residents relied almost exclusively on imports obtained at the start of the season on a credit account that was settled up by paying in dried fish in the fall. Some merchants, of course, used the truck system to amass huge fortunes, while many fishermen struggled under very heavy debt loads. It was an inherently volatile economic and social environment fraught with mutual suspicions. Planters feared merchants might seize their fish before fall. Traders eyed their debtors with trepidation, believing that they were always ready to sell their fish to the highest bidder. This all made the fishery highly vulnerable to disruptions, such as might occur in wartime. Like in any credit economy, the fishery was sustained only by the faith of those involved that it would continue. If confidence was shaken, the credit economy might collapse. Now it's important to remember that during the long period of peace that followed the Treaty of Utrecht signed in 1713, the resident population and its share of the fishery began to grow steadily. By the mid part of the 18th century, binary categories like merchant and planter begin to become misleading. Merchants based in England were traders but often employed servants themselves and were also engaged in the fishery on the side, sometimes as a primary enterprise. Planters, on the other hand, could also engage in the goods trade themselves, employing dozens of servants and renting fishing rooms out to others, such as the by boatmen who came here to fish each season. In our period, then, it is better, and for our purposes, better to think of the interests of these groups as being defined by their status as net creditors or net debtors. Net creditors accumulated property and invested capital in purchasing goods, which they sold to others on credit. They relied primarily on trade rather than the fishery to generate wealth. Net debtors, on the other hand, relied on credit and needed to maximize their participation in the fishery in order to pay for supplies, employ servants, and perhaps even turn a small profit. In this changeable world, then, the merchant planters and artisans who came to Newfoundland in growing numbers could find themselves in different economic positions at various stages in their lives. As Cadigan notes, the wage laboring servants they hired were not so much a proletariat underclass, but emergent planters themselves operating at a different life stage working in the fishery to earn money to return home and start up their own households. But we must now also broaden out our setting, for Newfoundland was never just an isolated system as we know, and to treat it as such distorts the island's history. Newfoundland has always been part of a wider Atlantic community, where spheres of power shift and overlap. As Pope argues, it was a central note, and I'm quoting him here, in an international network, that linked the island not only with the west country of England, but also with London, Liberia, the Mediterranean, the Atlantic Islands, the Netherlands, New England, and even New France. For our purposes, it is best, then, to think of this island as a node in several overlapping Atlantic worlds, one centered on England, the other on France. In the English Atlantic, the Newfoundland cod fishery fueled the uh, African slave labor on Car uh, Caribbean plantations, generated a prosperous trade between England and southern Europe, and encouraged the migration of thousands of Irish. It was a fluid, complex socioeconomic environment where ethnic, class, and political differences 
were transposed from Europe, but took on new meanings in important ways here on the island. It was never then a purely English space, although it did exist within a sphere of influence centered on London. Even the Avalon, where the British settlement was uh, most heavily concentrated, was not a homogenous place. By the middle part of the 18th century, most of the servants who supported the resident fishery came from Ireland. As John Mannion points out, Gaelic would have been more frequently heard in many parts of the island than English. Here, push factors on the other side of the Atlantic, bad harvests, religious persecution, and tales of fortune, enticed or forced thousands of Irish men and women to make the trek each year, not only to Newfoundland, but also to other nodes in the North Atlantic economy. Again, from Mannion's research, we know that, masters, or that as masters defaulted on wages or servants married into planter families, the number of permanent Irish Catholic residents of Newfoundland grew from almost none in 1698 to comprise over 40% of the population by 1750. The majority were young, unattached men who had a perception amongst the English merchant and planter classes that they were unstable, disloyal, and unreliable. Rebellious or not, the presence of these, quote, masterless men who overwintered on the island threatened to undermine pretensions to English control, domination, and subjugation. But if Gaelic, English, and the Gonquin language of the Beothic rang in the coves and inlets of the island, so too did Breton and Acadian French. Newfoundland was, of course, a significant part of an overlapping French Atlantic world that again linked slave posts in Western Africa to settled colonies and economic interests in the Caribbean, South America, Canada, and Louisiana. We commonly think of settlement as being synonymous with empire, but if we pause on this question for a moment, we'll realize that empires can take both formal and informal forms. In the French Atlantic, as Kenneth Bank argues, uh, colonies were viewed as economic zones of activities defined by the distinct resources that they produced. In some, like New France, extraction required settlement, but others could be exploited seasonally. Like the English, the French came to Newfoundland to fish cod. Settlements were established at first, but surrendered to the British with the Treaty of Utrecht. But as Alan Dwyer has clearly shown in his study of Notre Dame Bay region, a PhD thesis that was just completed in our department uh, last year, the French continued to exploit the fishery and to regard it as part of that overseas empire, straining, straining to control fishing grounds, the movements of people, and paths of economic and cultural communication long after their colony at Plaisance became placentia. The continued French commitment to Newfoundland reflected the tangible socio-economic and cultural connections that had developed between France's Atlantic merchant ports and the fishery. It is sometimes forgotten then that historically the French always caught more fish here than did the English. So if we are in agreement then that Newfoundland was simultaneously part of two Atlantic worlds, overlapping, essentially to the economic and military power of Britain and France, it follows logically that the island was destined to play a decisive role in the great imperial struggle that shaped the future of this continent, the Second Hundred Years' War between England and France. During the first hundred years of war, of course, England had lost its continental possessions bit by bit to steadily advancing French armies. But in the second century of conflict, it was France that watched its overseas empire fall to England, a peninsula here and an island there. By 1760, long-suffering New France had finally fallen, but King Louis' negotiators refused to relinquish the French state in the Newfoundland fishery. When negotiations broke off in 1761, the French Navy had been all but destroyed in a series of naval disasters that left the British holding roughly 50% of their sailors in captivity. The French war minister, the Duc de Choiseul, knew that if France was to challenge British naval supremacy in any future war, it would need to regain its nursery of seamen in England, or in uh, Newfoundland, sorry. As the war minister planned what would be France's final campaign of the war, economic imperatives combined with strategy. Choiseul chose to launch an invasion of Newfoundland in 1762, rather than develop other possible avenues of attack elsewhere in the French Atlantic, Africa, to South America, the Caribbean, as such an operation would not only make the best use of limited resources, but also provide an opportunity to reassert French claims to the fishery. Now, to command the mission, the French war minister chose uh, the Chevalier de Tournay, a young naval officer who had recently or had risen relatively quickly through posts in the Mediterranean to captain his own ship. France had only a few ships and even fewer sailors in 1762, so the campaign had to embody limited aims. Olaf Janssen has called it a raid, but as the instructions issued to Ternay on the 5th, 9th, and 12th of April suggest, it was more of a surgical strike. In the first set of instructions, Soiseul announced that Ternay's main goal would be to ravage and destroy the English fishery on the island and the banks of Newfoundland. This accomplished, Ternay was to land infantry, capturing St. John's. 
His men would then work up and down the coast, destroying and burning all the stores, boats, and fishing apparatus necessary to carry on the fishery. Trozul was clear that these tasks had to be completed no later than the beginning of November, when Ternay would return to France, leaving behind a small garrison to hold the city. Choiseul assigned the Comte de Haussonville as well as an artillery officer to oversee land operations, conduct the siege, and to make preparations to defend St. John for a protracted period, but an unspecified period of time. The third set of the instructions, I think, are the ones that are the most interesting, and add a new dimension to the mission that's been overlooked before. Given the lack of sailors in France, Ternay was to use the campaign to augment French manpower by recruiting a new regiment of soldier sailors from amongst the Irish Catholic population of the island. For this task, he was given the services of Jean-Baptiste Sutton de Clenard, the younger brother of a prominent Irish-French merchant named Thomas Sutton de Clenard. The Suttons were a Wexford merchant family who operated across both English and French trading networks in both Atlantic worlds. They appeared to have begun as salt meat merchants in Wexford during the 1740s, but as Lewis Cullen has shown by 1762, Thomas Sutton, the elder, had moved to France where he operated as a trader at St. Malo, the most important of the French fishery ports in Newfoundland. There he became prominent in that city's circle of merchant adventurers who linked the French metropolis to colonies in America, Africa, and India through a triangular trade in provisions, slaves, and raw materials. After the war, he would go on to lead the French East India Company and, along with the Duc de Choiseul, championed the failed French plantation scheme at Cayenne and Guiana. It was his younger brother, Jean-Baptiste, who ran the family's trading operations in Newfoundland. The younger Sutton was well known to both Irish and English inhabitants and was even recognized during the campaign by several witnesses. One of Ternay's captives, uh, captives, Francis Hearn, actually claimed that Sutton had been born on the island, although that's probably untrue. St. John's Justice of the Peace, John Stripling, specifically recognized him as a Wexford trader in salt meat and said that he was known to the people of the island. Now, before the outbreak of war, St. Malo's trade accounted for about 60% of France's dry fishery at Newfoundland, with some 70 ships and around 3,500 men making more than about 250,000 quintals of cod annually on the French shore beaches. He likely engaged in the trade of salt meat and dried fish, which he then brought back on his uh, return to Europe. As a man with a foot in Ireland, France, and Newfoundland, he was a logical choice to lead the recruiting mission. To this end, the war minister's final set of instructions ordered Ternay to be discriminate when he wreaked havoc, targeting the economic and social fabric of the island's fragile economy so that he might entice Irish servants to join Clonard and others to surrender. These are worth quoting from at length, so they're fascinating. Quote, In following your instructions to burn all vessels and fishing gear, you cannot fail but to reduce the fishermen to the greatest of miseries, which will present an opportunity to embark on your squadron all Irish and Catholic fishermen that you find. And in concert with Clonard, who is well known on the island, you will engage them in the service of the king and a battalion of Irish soldier sailors, who will be entrusted under the command and control of Monsieur Clonard until your arrival in France. To make it easier to achieve this goal, you will promise through Monsieur Clonard to those amongst their masters and marine officers to give on their arrival in France the grade of officers in the battalion if they're suited, uh, suitably prompt in training, if not at least in part. But the war minister was not done there with just recruiting an Irish, uh, a regiment of Irish Catholics. He also intended Ternay to use the same type of surgical tactics to induce prominent citizens to surrender themselves as prisoners of war. Ternay could then use these prisoners to renegotiate the release of French sailors who had been imprisoned in Britain. Again, he told the Admiral, quote, After having burnt the island of Newfoundland, on the island of Newfoundland, all the boats, magazines, and fishing gear, you will also threaten to burn the houses and remove all the people that you can take as prisoners of war, especially the justices of the peace and the judges of the country. To avoid deportation and the burning of their houses, they are sure to offer their surrender. You will then release them after signing an order of capitulation with the magistrates, which will stipulate an exchange of all the prisoners that you might, in the event, exchange for the same number of our officers, sailors, and seamen currently held in England. So while Cheney would burn all boats and fishing gear on the island that he found, he would give the Irish a stark, clear choice. Starve his masterless men in the winter without supplies or gear, or join with the French. On the other hand, prominent members of the community, those justices of the peace, who had specifically invested significant capital in their goods and fixed property in the island, would be induced to surrender so as to protect that accumulated wealth. Ternay set out at the beginning of May, and after a circuitous crossing to throw off the British searching squadrons that were combing the Atlantic after he slipped by the English blockade, his ships turned into bay bowls on the 24th of June. There they landed several hundred French soldiers on the Comte de Haussonville, a veteran of the fighting at Quebec. Once ashore, the French burned, as they promised, the flakes, stages, and boats. 
As was the plan, they only destroyed the homes and possessions of the English inhabitants who fled the town. The French commander then distributed copies of a manifesto, which you see here, which read, We, the Count de Haussonville, French general, do declare to all the inhabitants of the island of Newfoundland that the French grenadiers landed on the said island. We shall not do them any harm, but shall protect them. If they do not take arms, if they give us necessary succor, we bound them expressly as well with these justices of the peace and principal planters, do not leave their houses or settlements, neither to defend themselves. If they do anything against the said declaration, they shall be treated according to the laws of war. The manifesto was meant to convince prominent members of the population of nearby St. John's to surrender on the promise that their fixed property would be protected. The host on Bill's promises appealed to the interest of those net creditors whose greatest liability was the goods, provisions, and stores that they had already accumulated to sell to others. The French believed that they might be induced to switch masters so long as their trade and their investments were protected. The next day, Ternay's force began the eight-mile march northwards to the port, guided by Irish fishermen recruited at Bay Bulls. But while these net creditors might be persuaded to have accepted the French offer, net debtors were more inclined to resist. These, we will recall, are the people who relied on both wage labor and imported provisions to fish. If the French only spared these people's houses, they would be still left destitute without any supplies. In this category, those with the most to lose were the planters who participated in the island's only real mixed economy based in the thriving communities of Conception Bay. As illustrated by the chart that's up on the screen, the permanent population of Conception Bay, men, women, and children, had grown by nearly 400% in the decade after 1752. By the time of the invasion, there were a total of around 320 resident male planters and traders living in the bay, most of whom would have hired servants to work in the fishery. Now, these numbers are rough, and we have to be careful with them because they do come from uh, the states of the fishery, which are slightly contested documents. But they give us an indication of population at the least. This remarkable increase was supported by concurrent growth in agriculture, so that by 1762, each male resident on average had just over six acres of improved land and about 4.3 children. This agricultural base reinforced the dominance of the resident fishery, so that by 1760, the last year before the occupation, that has complete figures, it accounted for more than 75% of the total catch compared with only 60% eight years before. At the same time, the economy was diversifying so that by the time of the invasion, seal oil and trapping were becoming major sources of income during the winter. Unlike the townspeople in St. John's, these resident fishermen would have been dependent on local trade networks for the acquisition of supplies, local buyers for their fish oil, and furs, and stable sources of migrant labor. They had little to gain, in other words, to agree to the whole sum of terms. As the French marched from Bay Bulls, 370 men from Conception Bay descended on St. John's, ready to help the local garrison resist the invaders. The annual state of the fishery for that year lists the total male population, resident and migrant, of Conception Bay as about 2,400 for 1762, which would suggest that a minimum of just over 15% had volunteered. But those volunteers would most likely have been drawn from the actual planter populations, the permanent residents, and thus represent a much larger proportion of the total permanent population. While Fort William, which protected the north side of the harbour, was in a poor state of repair, and garrisoned by only 80 soldiers, there were factors <laughs> that favoured a resistance. As the French drew near, it was clear that they would be unable to haul their artillery over the difficult roads. The 500 men under de Haussonville would thus have had no way of taking the fort but by a direct infantry assault across open ground defended by 10 British cannons. Buoyed by the appearance of the civilian volunteers, the garrison's commander, Captain Ross, gave orders to distribute arms and ammunition, bringing the total British force to around 450 men. It was by no means a hopeless cause. So what happened? When the French made camp before the town on the evening of the 26th of June, the Comte de Haussonville dispatched a revised version of his manifesto, promising that if the inhabitants surrendered themselves without taking up arms, they would be treated as Frenchmen and would not be molested. On the contrary, he wrote, we will protect you. While the planters from Conception Bay prepared to resist, many of the townspeople, who would have included established merchants, emerging traders, and artisans, were more inclined to listen to the French offer. These people, who had made their living primarily through trade, had made significant investments in goods and capital equipment at St. John's, which of course by 1762 was a thriving commercial trading center. For example, a detailed list of imports from July 1760 shows 46 ships arriving in the harbor and indicates that traders were increasingly importing not only basic provisions and equipment for the fishery, but also luxury goods like silk, tobacco, refined sugar, and olive oil. That month alone, two of the ships brought in 100 pairs of women's shoes, 
50 dozen pairs of men's shoes, 11 chests of wearing apparel, and 150 ready-made luxury garments, all for resale in St. John's. Those who lived and worked there stood to lose everything if the garrison did not agree to double some of terms. If treated like Frenchmen, though, they might at the very least protect those investments. But to the horror of the townspeople, the next day when the French colonel demanded the fort's surrender, the negotiators went away while the British soldiers began distributing ammunition and loading their guns. While Dehosoville prepared to assault the fort, 24 of the town's principal merchants and inhabitants demanded a meeting with Captain Ross. They presented him with the petition that's up on the screen, which read, in part, We beg leave to represent to you our great fears at your sending away the flag of truce and refusing to give up this fort. We have hitherto done everything in our power according to your directions for the good of His Majesty's service. But we must now acknowledge that we are not able to do more and that you are not to expect that neither we nor other inhabitants will wait till this place is stormed by such a superior power, and our effects, families, and lives being then at the mercy of the enemy. Now, as the officers of the garrison later reported, upon receiving this paper, Captain Ross, the commander, determined that without the support of these townspeople, it would be impossible to defend the fort. He emerged from the meeting with Michael Gill, a local merchant and the chief magistrate, telling the crowd of civilian volunteers to disperse, and that, quote, when their services were wanted, the men would be sent for. The officers and magistrates then signed surrender papers for the fort and town. It's telling, I think, that the petition lists the townspeople's, fe the townspeople's fears in that particular order. Our effects, our families, our lives. They had, in fact, behaved exactly as the French had anticipated they would. As Gill explained in a letter to Charles Garland, a merchant and magistrate at Harbour Grace, they had advocated for capitulation because the French general had, quote, promise that we shall be secure in our possessions and effects, which is the terms for capitulation. In surrendering, the townspeople saw an opportunity to protect their accumulated material wealth, I argue, and those who made their living from trade did so by exploiting larger networks. For many, the island was only one node amongst many others. When St. John surrendered, it became the temporary headquarters then of the French garrison in Newfoundland. And that summer, de Hossauville began to improve the town's defenses in anticipation of a British attack and the long winter ahead while they deported many of the English inhabitants. Meanwhile, Ternay seized 40 ships in the harbor, outfitting the larger vessels with cannons and skeleton crews to assert French authorities in communities further up the coast. One of the harbors occupied was Trinity. Although its history and the story of these events has been docu uh, documented ably by Gordon Hancock, allow me here to draw out a few parallels between events there and at St. John's. In Trinity, a similar debate ensued between net debtors who wished to defend their homes and net creditors who were more inclined to attempt to negotiate with the French and to use the occupation to their advantage. The diary of prominent Trinity merchant Benjamin Lester provides a unique window into this complex world of occupied Newfoundland and the complex choices made by the inhabitants, and even the new opportunities it created for him and others for trade. According to Lester, word reached Trinity that the French had sacked Babels on the 30th of June, fairly quickly for the time. Lester was hesitant at first to organize a defense, as he had also learned that the French were, quote, humane people who don't hurt anybody but protect them. The general, the Comte de Haussonville, published his manifesto under his own hands to all the inhabitants of Newfoundland, promising that if they would keep the provisions of their houses and give him succor, he would not hurt them, which we hear he has complied with. At Bay Bulls, they burnt all the houses except two, which was all that was possessed. Wherever they wanted, they, or sorry, whatever they wanted, they paid for it. While some residents advocated for resistance, it was all but impossible without the blessing of Leicester and the other merchant elites, who not only controlled access to arms and ammunition, but also governed supplies and labor. When French forces finally arrived on 17th of July, the town's principal inhabitants chose to follow the same course as their counterparts in St. John's, surrendering after firing a symbolic shot from the tiny battery, or tiny battery at the entrance of the harbor. At least that's what Leicester wrote in his diary. Capitulation at Trinity soon became collaboration, though, for the merchant. Each day during the two-week occupation, the Commandant, as Lester called him, gave orders for provisions which Lester obtained from amongst the townspeople. In gathering supplies and information, it is telling that the French appointed the existing chief magistrate as their liaison, leaving the local British social structure intact, but co-opting it to their own purposes. In cooperating, Lester was able to preserve his life and property, but he also managed to profit from the new trade he carried on with the French. When goods were demanded, Lester noted in his diary that the French refused to take anything from him without paying for it, even gifts of beer and wine intended to win this, their favor. While Lester expropriated livestock and provisions from his neighbors, he also sold brandy, malt, soap, and other goods to the French from his own stores. He also began to hire out his boats and his own servants to carry supplies and provisions to the garrison in Conception Bay and in St. John's. 
Gordon Hancock it was right to say that Lester used this relationship with the French to protect his friends and neighbors from complete ruin. But it is also clear that he used the occupation to improve his own long-term economic position. For example, he repeatedly targeted two rival residents, Lambert and Terrell, taking all of their livestock and much of their provisions to meet French demands without paying any compensation. When the French began to burn, uh, burn boats, flakes, and stages, as well as the houses of those who had fled the town, it was Lester who accompanied the French around the bay and chose which properties would be destroyed and which would be spared. He wrote all this down, of course, in his diary. Both Lambert and Terrell's works in the harbor were destroyed on his orders. These two men were merchant planter traders who continued to hire servants to fish, but had also begun to extend credit to others themselves. We know this because according to the detailed name files that were compiled by Keith Matthews and are now held at the Maritime History Archive at Munn, Lambert was married with two boats and 18 servants at the time of the invasion. He was a local church warden and an overseer of the poor, and sometimes he acted as well for an agent for the Ballard West, Merchant, uh, West Country Merchants. He had his own legal run-ins with Lester before the invasion as well. And indeed, much of what we know about what happened from the invasion comes from court records when Lambert and Terrell sued Lester afterwards. Terrell seems to have owned multiple room stages and ships at Trinity, and as emergent traders, both men were upstart rivals. Targeting them allowed Lester to turn the occupation to his own advantage, for when it came to an end, he would be better positioned to reestablish trade. As Alan Dwyer has argued in his case study of Lester's expansion into Notre Dame Bay in the 1770s, almost a decade and a half later, it was typical of a larger pattern in which the merchant used ambiguities of contested spaces to his advantage trading allies to ruthlessly eliminate junior rivals. Emerging planter traders at Lambert and Terrell were most vulnerable as they were both uh, in debt to more senior merchants and had the most of their assets tied up in the credit that they, did, that they had already extended to fishermen. Unlike Lester, they had no authority, power, or wealth, though, with which to bargain for favorable treatment. This, of course, heightened fears, even where the French failed to appear, leading planters and emergent traders to take precipitate action whenever they suspected that they or their debtors might become insolvent. At St. Mary's Harbor, for example, Henry Thresher, a junior, junior agent of a pool merchant, decided to seize about 1,300 quintals of cod, as well as a proportionate amount of train oil from one of his debtor planters, a man named Thomas Townsend. In consequence, Townsend's servants abandoned him, knowing that he would be unable to pay them their wages. But just as nervous creditors might move in to seize their debtor's fish, if they saw an opportunity to cut their losses, so too might a fisherman's servants preemptively desert as soon as they suspected that their master would be unable to pay. John Power of Tilton Harbor, for example, hired uh, William Sullivan and several other men to fish for him in September of 1761 on a two-year contract. Even though the French never reached the harbor, his merchant on the mainland disappeared and his supplies ran out around August 1st. His servants abandoned him then for lack of provisions late that summer. While servants provided the labor necessary to fish, they were still creditors themselves with a claim on their master's profits. This made them a potential liability when supplies ran low or catches proved poor. Everywhere then, mutual suspicions between debtors and creditors and the tensions inherent in the truck system combined to constrain, or constrain credit and stall the fishery. Many net debtors in Trinity and elsewhere, understandably then, chose to flee as soon as word of the French landing at Babel's began to spread and resistance proved impossible. As one note in a larger Atlantic world, we must remember that Newfoundland was not a closed economic or social system. It was a place where merchants, planters, and servants earned a living through various means, but all had social, cultural, and economic ties to other nodes in that network. According to witness accounts, most residents actually left Bay Bulls Harbor, probably while the French were still turning into the bay, hence Lester's comment that only two of the houses were found to be occupied, boarding ships bound for England or the mainland. When two small boats docked, for example, at Ting Mount near Exxon on the 18th of July, they reported that they had put into, quote, Petty Harbor just north of Bay Bulls, and they found that the houses were there entirely deserted. There is good evidence to suggest that in most of the settled areas of the island, many families simply abandoned their homes once resistance proved impossible. In Conception Bay, quote, the fishermen there were said to be in the utmost state of confusion, leaving their effects and endeavoring to embark on the first vessels that they could find. As indicated by a review of the table that we saw uh, up here on the screen, the permanent population of Conception Bay dropped by nearly 40% between 1762 and 1763. At the same time, the value of seal oil and furs taken in the winter dropped by roughly 80%, while the number of acres under cultivation dropped by 89% year over year. But the decision to flee was constrained by access to an ocean-going ship or the wealth to pay for passage aboard another person's vessel. Those trapped in the island could only try and carry on as best they could. 
At Trinity, when merchant planter John Lemon fled in June, his servants used the provisions he left behind to keep on fishing. In Conception Bay, when Henry Weber, a planter at Harbor Grace, fled to New England, his servant John Butt continued to fish and to make oil until the end of the season. Again, though, some actually managed to turn the situation to their advantage. At Brigus, planters James Keating and Cornelius Cannon fled their fishing rooms, leaving behind a, qual a quantity of uncured fish and oil. Their neighbor's servant, John Malloy, then took the fish, cured it, and sold it for a profit. This was the exception, though. Planters like Darby Coughlin of Fogo more often tried to retain what supplies and fish that they had for themselves. Coughlin said his servants Richard Wright, John Reeve, and John Coffey, quote, away in an old boat with very little provisions, even though that they were desirous to stay on and keep fishing. Those who were sent away could only look forward to a long, harsh winter without shelter or supplies. So here we return to the Irish question. So faced with almost certain death in winter, it is small wonder then that the Irish servants were easily induced to trade English masters for French once uh, the fishery and their source of sustenance ground to a halt. While the Duc de Choiseul's plan specifically targeted Irish Catholics, it is telling and key that the campaign of destruction was orchestrated so as to make the main motivator economic, not religious or political. The relationships between English and Irish had often, and far too simplistically, been cast in binary terms of those of Protestant master and Catholic victim, implying that ties were defined only by ideological, colonial, and religious struggle. But as John Manning has argued, though, this ignores the important and changeable position of the Irish in the North Atlantic world, where they were as adept as other members of that wider community at utilizing socio-economic networks to secure their own interests. Newfoundland was just one market among many that demanded their labor. Just as merchants used the French occupation to their advantage and planters utilized trade networks to flee, so too were some servants able to negotiate with the French, transitioning their labor between overlapping imperial economies. The task of redirecting servant labor to French purposes fell to Jean-Baptiste Sutton de Clenard, the Wexford salt meat merchant we met a few minutes ago, who landed with de Haussonville in June, Bay Bulls. Now, just as de Haussonville's manifesto induced traders to capitulate, so too did it create conditions favoring the recruitment of servants. He convinced servants to join him by promising to pay them from the first day that they joined with the French in Newfoundland, thus offering a secure economic opportunity and alternative in the face of certain hardship. Word of the French offer spread quickly amongst the servant population. You can imagine as their masters begin to flee, uh, how quickly word would spread. And it was reported that during the summer, nearly 2,000 Irishmen converged on St. John's looking for work. From this pool, Sutton managed to select 356 of, quote, the strongest and most able servants to join his new regiment. These men are young, strong, and robust, he wrote to Choiseul. They are accustomed to the sea, learning their trade from the cod fishery, and are excellent sailors. According to the detailed nominal role, which you see part of up here on the screen, and it's a long document, he submitted on his return to France, uh, the average age of these Irish recruits was just under 23, the youngest being 17, the oldest 50. When they were fitted out for uniforms, and you can see that column up there, 79% were described as requiring a size large, 17% as medium, and only 2% as small, indicating that the vast majority were above average size. Now, to put this in perspective, size large was meant for French grenadiers, who were reputed to be some of the tallest and largest soldiers uh, in the early modern world. The nine Irishmen who were recruited to be officers in the regiment were generally older. The average age of these men was just over 27, and may have, in fact, been planters themselves. Several were educated and spoke Latin. They assisted in recruitment and oversaw the work of several hundred additional Irish laborers who did not join the army, but were nevertheless employed in building the defenses at St. John's and in some of the raiding operations of the coast. Again, though, we must reiterate that the majority of these Irish servants were not acting out of any sense of disloyalty. As English magistrate John Stripling observed, most were indeed probably well disposed to their English masters. But like the merchants and planters, they too were faced with complex choices during the occupation. The Irish had come to Newfoundland to earn a living. With their wages lost, passage home blocked, and the fishery suspended, exchanging English masters for French not only provided a chance to escape a potentially deadly situation, but also a way to pursue new economic opportunities. It's telling, then, that of the 334 recruits who accompanied the French back across the sea to disembark at Brest, only 14 actually chose to remain in the French army, while 12 opted to join the French Navy as able seamen. Of the remainder, 242 joined French merchant vessels as seamen on those vessels, while Sutton was able to convince a further 49 to go with him on a separate Irish economic expedition to Cayenne in South America. In total, then, 87% who joined the French in Newfoundland chose to work as able seamen on French merchant ships of one sort or another. 
Only 8% opted to remain in either the French Navy or the Army, while the remaining 5% languished in hospital. Like the Newfoundland ambassadors, they took advantage of transatlantic connections and overlapping socioeconomic networks, which acted as conduits for migrant Irish workers in both war and peacetime. The decisions of Irish, uh, English and Irish civilians, as well as the planning of French officers, assumed that the British would be unable to mount an expedition to relieve the island before winter. Choiseul d d thus dispatched two ships with reinforcements and supplies to assist Ternay's efforts to hold St. John's, but while British operations against France's Spanish ally in Havana went well and ended in the second week of August, the North American Commander-in-Chief, Jeffrey Amherst, ordered a relieving force to retake Newfoundland. As Olaf Janssen has argued, the 1762 campaign underscored the fundamental importance of sea power in protecting empire, at least in that arena. France was no match for, the great, for great Britain. Both relief ships were captured before they could actually reach Newfoundland by British patrols, while Admiral Colville was easily able to sail north from Halifax and land infantry and artillery under Colonel William Amherst at Torbay on 13 September. From there, the infantry marched overland course by Kitty Vitty and surprised the French forces atop Signal Hill on the 15th. The next night, Ternay's ships slipped out of the harbour in a dense fog, leaving a small force under de Hossonville to hold the fort. Without reinforcements, the French commander had little choice but to surrender three days later. Because the British attack on St. John's was such a dramatic victory, one in which an outnumbered uh, group of British soldiers scrambled up steep cliffs in heavy fog to rout a superior force at the top, this has tended to overshadow the damage done to the island's economy and society during the three months of occupation. Romantic narratives that focus on battles alone ignore the fact that in 1762, the English fishery was all but destroyed. Between 1755 and 1760, total fish exported to market had averaged about 300,000 quintals per year. In 1762, it was only 50,000, 84% below average. While the island's society and economy would, of course, rebounded over the next decade, the immediate effect on the island's fabric was clear. As the complex relationships between net creditors and net debtor debtors broke down, when the fishery stalled, the French exploited the vulnerable position of the population to their own ends. Faced with difficult choices, some merchants, planters, and servants fled, others tried to resist, while still others collaborated. These choices were simultaneously constrained and enabled by the existence of overlapping trade networks, which limited the choices of some while allowing others to survive and even profit during the occupation. For those with something to offer the invaders, the occupation presented, in fact, an opportunity sometimes to develop new connections between the island and other opportunities beyond. As Imperial historian Eric Hinderaker notes, it was in these fluid, informal, and changeable environments that Imperial policies and character grew organically from the choices made by ordinary people in times of crisis and uncertainty. Invasions and occupations were a most acute form of Imperial crisis when ordinary civilians responded to wartime pressures in extraordinary ways. Although histories of these events are usually written from the point of view of the combatants, we should look at the invasions and occupations as socio-economic events that were experienced and influenced by civilians. They were important moments of possibility and change as ordinary people did make choices to resist, flee, accommodate, or collaborate, and thereby influence the nature and development of empire. Now, as I go on to talk about in the uh, article version of this talk tonight, in the wake of the events of 1762, official British policy began to evolve. The British governors who came to the island, men like Thomas Graves and Hugh Palliser, were forced to acknowledge the contested nature of British authority and contend with governing a colony where French and British spheres of influence continued to overlap. The policies they formulated sought as much to minimize the ability of merchants and workers to move between these two economic and cultural worlds while reducing the importance of foreign influences. But the role of defenses in the events of 1762 in promoting the adoption of Palliser's Law is a story that I think we must leave for another day. Thank you very much. Uh, those of you who attended the uh, James Cook Symposium in September of uh, recognize that 1762 was also the year that James Cook first showed up in St. John's. Uh, the British would certainly recognize the importance of uh, improved navigational charts around the island for military purposes. And that was the first of six years that James Cook spent in Newfoundland. So, uh, anyway, questions, comments for Mark? I must have been a very thorough presentation. <laughs> I'm not a historian, but I just want to ask you a question. They made it up to Trinity, is that correct? They did, yes. Did, did they control the coast at all? Was Cape Bonvista that area too, or was that pretty well still left to the British? 
Um, they sailed a little bit north of Trinity, but they didn't go. They didn't really raid too much further north than Bonavista, I don't think. At least if they did, it wasn't recorded. Part of the problem is that there was um, there was one main French commander who went up to Trinity and based his operations there, and then sent out small ships that they commandeered with skeleton crews to raid up the coast. But where those boats went, we don't really know. Um, other than you know, many of them said they went up north, but it sounds like they probably didn't go much north of Bonavista because at least uh, when you look at the court records afterwards, you don't see any examples of um, people filing claims because uh, flake stages and houses were burned north of there, for example. And, uh, one That's difficult because part of the problem is that when <laughs> there are lots of reference, well, the White Boys are, are, are a group of Irish, uh, basically mercenaries who are fighting on the side of the French during uh, the Seven Years' War and, and later wars as well. And in a lot of the, the works, they suggest that there's a, a company of White Boys, about 120 men, who come with the French over to Newfoundland. There is no record of that in the actual French documents that I've seen. There are references to the Irish spattered throughout, but they tend to be, as far as I can tell, the Irish that they recruited in Newfoundland. It gets confusing because, as you can imagine, they don't specify off from the regiments, they simply say the Irish. So it, it could be one or the other. It may have been that people saw references at one time to the Irish and assumed that they must have been part of the white boy brigades that were also fighting at the same time. Um, there is a reference of the Irish being at the top of Signal Hill in Ternay's diary, for example, um, uh, during the battle. And it's unclear whether those individuals would have been uh, men brought over, we don't know, or if they would have been uh, the people who were recruited here. If they were, that would have been an interesting dynamic, I think, at the top of the uh, signal hill. But it's a good question. The documents are actually fairly unclear on that. But it is in the literature, you're right. So, the Irish that were recruited to the French Marine, uh, let's say they, I'm sure a few of them were captured by the British. I actually don't know because the war at that point the war ends. They join up uh, the French Merchant Marine in basically April 1763, just as the treaty is being signed. So that's largely um, unknown, right? Because France and Britain aren't at war then after that. So uh, would they have been treated as traitors? It depends on if they'd ever signed an oath of allegiance to the king or not. That makes sense. There's no records of people being taken off uh, ships and tried or anything like that. That I've seen. Anything else? Thank you.